Good morning and happy Easter to you. Would you stand with us and let's sing together. Let's praise the risen Savior, Jesus, our God, our creator, become flesh to die for my sins. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now Oh, this is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God, this is what he does He saves us He bore the cross he beat the grave Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus yes. Remember Remember that fear that took our breath away And faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word Every whisper, yes, he did. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Oh, never once did he fail, and he never will. I believe it. Oh, this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us, he bore the cross, he beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. He pulled me out of that pit, he did, he did, who paid for all of our sins. Nobody but Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit Who? He did yeah. Who paid for all of our sin Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave celebrate a risen Savior today, Jesus. Amen. He gets all the glory and praise. And he fought a battle that we couldn't win. We couldn't pay for our own sins. We needed a Savior. We were desperate and lost without him. Let's sing.
grateful to our Savior? Are you thankful? Can we declare our gratefulness to our God? Because He shed His blood for us. And we believers have an overwhelming joy because of what the Savior has done. I was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the bridge was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the
Just linger there for a moment. And in your heart, can you pray a prayer of thanksgiving to your Savior? Majesty and kindness and loving kindness and goodness was poured out on the cross. What a display of your almighty character, Jesus. What incredible wisdom, Father. We magnify your name because the beauty of this plan and the way it shows who you are is so incredible. Our minds cannot fathom it, fathom it but we are so grateful. I pray if there's anybody in here today that did not receive at one point in their life the free gift of Jesus Christ, that you would work on their hearts today. Show them that their salvation is not of works that they can do but solely by trusting in the finished work that we celebrate today, your death and your resurrection as the perfect spotless lamb. I pray many would come to know you and respond to your call. Teach us today in your word and give us a deeper appreciation of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. He is risen. Oh, man. No, that's not going to work. I'll tell you what, it feels early for some of you. Some of us were here at 6 a.m. I got here about 6.15, so I can't really say that I was here that early for the sunrise service. But we're awake now. So when I say he is risen, we're going to respond with he is risen indeed. All right, you ready? He is risen. He is risen there it is. Now we can start. Now we can start. Hey, over the last week... Uh, going through the Holy Week, looking at uh, the, the very end of Jesus' earthly ministry. We, we've gotten to uh, kind of walk through a short series called The Pledge, The Turn, and The Prestige. And those may be very weird words to you, and I want to help you understand them. They're, they're actually the three parts of a magic trick. And I want to give this disclaimer here real quick. In Jesus' life and the work that he did, in his death on the cross, and his burial and resurrection, there was nothing magical or trickery happening. There was nothing of that sort. It was miraculous. But in it, we can see some very interesting pieces I think line up really well with this. And I want to walk you through what it looks like. You see, in, in a magic trick, they have the pledge where it's the setup, where you're shown something ordinary. Maybe it's a, a small object that, that they're going to make disappear. I think about Palm Sunday with Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey's colt. And he is being presented by God on the day that they are to select their lambs for sacrifice. Here comes God's selected lamb presented to come into Jerusalem. And they're proclaiming our king, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord God. Save us. You've sent us a savior. I think about the next part of a magic trick is called the turn. This is where that object disappears. This is the unexpected or unexplainable piece. As we talked about on Friday night at our Good Friday service, we were thinking about how interesting of a switch and how kind of chaotic of a switch it was for people to go from shouting, Hosanna, our king, to crucify him in the same week. What a turn to see the one that they wanted raised to the throne, raised to a cross instead. And now, as his disciples look on, he is dead. And his body is taken and buried. Then comes the prestige. The prestige is where the object reappears, where it comes back. But before that happens, there's a tension. And this is where we're at. We're in this Tension. I want you to, to think about this from the perspective of Jesus' followers, of his disciples. Think of what this week was like for them. 
They come into Jerusalem having just been told by Jesus that he is coming here to be handed over to the ruling authorities and to be killed. They didn't like that. They tried to talk him out of it. That didn't go so well. But as they're coming into the city, crowds are gathering and celebrating. People are waving palm branches and laying their coats down so that Jesus doesn't touch the dirt, but is honored. They're calling him a king. Can you imagine walking next to him through that crowd as people are cheering for your friend, for the one you've been walking with for years? He doesn't need to die. We, look at this. We've got people with us. They're ready to make you king. Let's just do this, Jesus. This is what we've been waiting for. And then they spend a week watching Jesus do things that they didn't really understand, though they should have. He had explained to them what he was doing again and again and again, what he was there to do. And they kept missing it. Comes to, to this moment where they have a supper together, this final meal. And Jesus is handing them bread and saying, this is my body broken for you, a cup. This is my blood poured out for you. These are very intense statements. And then one of their own gets up to leave and betray him. Can you imagine the feeling, the shock of what was going on for these disciples? As they watch him arrested, they start thinking their lives are now in danger. They're running, they're hiding. Some are denying even knowing him. And as they watch from a distance, he's crucified. And it's over. Think about this week and what that would have felt like for them. And as we see him hung on the cross, we step into scripture here in Matthew 27, verse 57. That's where we're going to start. And Jesus has, has died and it says this, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. Do you see what's happening here? These men have, have gotten to this point where they are so desperate for something that they are even worried after the one who is taking it from them is dead. They're worried about what's still to come. They're nervous about this. They have to do something because they know what he said. They know what could happen. We got to make sure no tricks come in. But as I said, there's no trick involved in what happened. This is what's amazing about it. Now, when we're talking about magic, there's always a name that pops into my head. It's Harry Houdini. Now, Houdini, not necessarily a, a magician, but an escape artist, right? This is what he was good at. And the way that he worked and, and did things was intense for people. He would chain himself up in these crazy ways and be lowered headfirst into these big tubs of water. And somehow he'd escape before he died. He would go from town to town and he would challenge the police to cuff him and chain him in whatever way they wanted to. And he could always escape. Pretty intense things and, and, and incredible. But as he started gaining some notoriety, he needed new tricks. And so he came up with one that he would chain himself up and he would go to a prominent bridge in a city and he would jump into the water, chained up, unable to swim, 25, 30 feet down. The jump itself is dangerous. Being chained up afterwards is even more dangerous. And then to have to unchain yourself and get to the surface so you can breathe again. This is a very intense thing. And he would go from city to city doing this. But there's one time where he had invited his mom to come and watch him. I don't know about you, but if I were his mother, I don't know that I'd want to watch that. But she came and she watched. And he performed this trick. It was incredible. 
And, and recently he had his diaries that had been held back released to public in the last couple of years so that people could see a little bit more into it. And everybody expected there to be all of these tricks and how he did it explained out in it, but none of that's there. In fact, what's there is something very different. We get to see a little bit into the life and heart of this man. And on the day that he, he made this jump in front of his mom, he came home. He opened up his diary and he wrote these words, Ma saw me jump with an exclamation point. You see, the most exciting thing about it was not that 10,000 people were there, but there was one, one who mattered. You see, this man whose life was shrouded in mystery and wonder is revealed in his own words to have a heart longing for the same thing that you and I long for. You see, he, he wanted acceptance, approval, and love. He wanted this from his mother. She was a very important person in his life. And to have her there to watch him felt like he had gained it. But I'll tell you, as you continue through his life, you realize he's still chasing it and kept chasing it all the way to his death. You see, the extremes that we will go to in order to gain these things is shocking. And every single time we feel like we've gone just far enough, it's got to be right here, just in reach. We always realize it's just a little bit further. Because this acceptance, approval, and love are always just a little bit further. Never can quite get a hold of him. And this is the same struggle that drove those religious leaders to crucify Jesus. You see, he was taking followers from them. They were the teachers of Israel. They were the people that everyone was to come to and listen to. And they led and they had followings and they had people that were with them. They were popular. They were well known. They were loved by people. And then this guy shows up and starts teaching with authority and doing these signs and wonders Claiming to be the son of God, the Messiah, and all of our followers are following him. And we're losing what we thought we had. Our acceptance, our approval, the love of the people. And it drove them to crucify him. Look how far they went and even continued to go after his death. We can't let anything take this from us. We need to, we need to seal this tomb up. They put a seal on it, making it illegal for it to be opened or touched without permission. They put a guard in front of it. These are trained military men there to block anyone from accessing that tomb. They were worried that they were still at risk of losing what they thought they could get back by killing him. This acceptance, approval, and love. This is the same struggle that drove the disciples of Jesus to so easily miss his words as he declared over and over again that he was going to be put to death and be raised again. You see, their Messiah, the Son of God, their friend, there's no way that he would actually die, right? There's no way that this would happen. And yet, there they sat, hiding, afraid, believing that the one that they had followed must have just been another failed attempt to gain what they longed for so much. Sadly, all of them had missed the prestige, the reveal. You see, God had revealed something absolutely astounding already. There was acceptance, approval, and love for them that they didn't have to chase after. Acceptance, approval, and love for us that we don't have to strive for. You see, surrounding the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, there were some weird things happening. Some strange things were going on. Things that no one expected and yet God was using to declare the most incredible truth of all time. In Matthew 27, we see this moment where Jesus is crucified, the moment that he dies. And it tells us something that happens in verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split some intense things that are happening here, but I, I want you to hear this. The curtain in the temple tears in two. This isn't just a curtain like what's in your house. You see, the curtain in the temple was there for a purpose. It was to separate the presence of God, his earthly seat for his glory, from his people for the sake of his people to be close to him and yet not able to be in his presence because he is holy and they are sinful and to be in his presence as a sinful man meant your destruction as judgment must come. So God in his love had given a way for them to be near him. 
In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 3, it tells us behind the second curtain, that's this curtain we're talking about, was a room called the most holy place. The most holy place. It wasn't that the rest of the temple wasn't holy. It's just this was where God was, his presence. And this was a place that once a year... One high priest selected by God after giving a blood sacrifice for his own sins and the sins of the people could enter, perform a short ceremony, and come back out. One person, once a year, after being covered by blood to cover for sin. This is an intense place, and so I want you to realize when it says this curtain tore in two, That meant anyone standing near it, anyone in the temple is now exposed to what was hidden, the presence of God. I love that it tells us how it was torn. It says it was torn from top to bottom. It's like God himself reached down and ripped it apart, saying there is no more need for this separation because one has paid the price to allow access here for all. I don't know if you understand this curtain. This is 60 feet tall, 40 feet wide, and about a foot thick. It would have shaken the whole building as they heard it rip open, as God declared access open to him. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 tells us, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. You see, what God was doing was replacing that curtain in the temple with a new one. It's the body of Jesus through what he has done. We can enter into his presence. And it doesn't say that we can enter kind of sheepishly or quietly or calmly or or hesitantly. It says with confidence because of what Jesus has done. I don't have to be afraid. I can enter into his presence with confidence. Jesus' death was a one-time sacrifice for sin that opened up full acceptance of sinners into the presence of God, but only through him. You see, in him, we have acceptance. We find acceptance in him. I continue thinking through the, the resurrection story, and there's this character that's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. That's why I think it's amazing. When it's mentioned by all four Gospel accounts, we should probably take note of that. And this character, her name is Mary Magdalene. And what's interesting about Mary is if you don't know who she is, this is a woman with a past. This is a woman who isn't who you'd probably want to mention being involved. You see, we're introduced to Mary in Luke 8. Chapter, or chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, it says this. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. This is a woman who had seven demons in her. She was fully possessed. And Jesus released her from this. Do you understand, though, that women in Jesus' time did not typically carry these important roles, which made involvement of women in Jesus' ministry this radical thing? This was an incredible thing. You see, rabbis, teachers of the law like Jesus, those that were respected as teachers, they didn't even talk to their wives and daughters very often in public, let alone talk to these other women, let alone talk to a woman who had had seven demons. Do you know what that meant culturally for them? She had to have sinned so bad to receive that kind of response. Her family had to have sin going back generation after generation. This was a woman who would have been seen as less than human to the rest of her culture. No way she should be welcomed in. And yet, this is who Jesus invites into the most incredible moment. John 20, 11 through 18. Now Mary Magdalene stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. You may look and say, well, how did she not know? Why would she think he'd be standing there? He was dead. 
They had stolen his body is what she believed. She's not going to look up through her tears and see him and go, oh, there he is. She doesn't expect him to be there at all. Thinking it was the gardener, or he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I want you to understand, women in this time were not even called upon in a court of law as a witness because their witness was not considered credible in their culture. But Mary is who Jesus reveals himself to first. This is amazing to me because he was declaring something incredible. She may not have the approval of her culture, but she had found approval in God. This was a declaration for all of us who long for but do not have approval. Those of us who feel that our past or our choices, our failures, our sin removes the chance of being approved of. And Jesus was declaring that in him we have approval. In him, we have approval. I don't know if you know this, but covering has been a big part of the story of God and man from the very beginning. Adam and Eve, God made them perfect. They placed them in a garden, and it says that they were naked and unashamed. They had no fear of this because there was no sin. So they were just there, living freely. And then when they sin, what's the first thing that they notice? Their nakedness. They feel ashamed. What do they do? They take leaves and they try to sew together clothes for themselves. The same way we take good deeds and try to cover up the bad things we've done. They put these together and and attempt to cover their shame. And then God shows up. Their sin is made clear. And what does God do? He takes an animal and he kills it. Sheds its blood and makes from the skin of this animal, clothes for them to cover them. And from there we see a system of sacrifice, blood being shed for the forgiveness of sins. But it wasn't for full forgiveness, but yet just for covering because they had to do it again and again and again. We had to cover God's presence in the tabernacle, which was like a mobile temple for them as they were in the wilderness They had a huge curtain that blocked God's presence from the people so that they could not be there together but close. As they built the temple, they had this curtain blocking the holy of holies that people could not enter unless God had brought them in. There was a covering of sin in their piety. It's their self Righteousness, their personal holiness. You see, they would live in their culture in such a way that would display how close to God they were, how righteous they were. The way that they dressed showed this. They had different tassels on their clothes. I'm just glad we don't wear tassels anymore, everyone. Okay, but they had tassels on their clothes that represented holiness and showed people around them just how good they were. They had prayer shawls that were decorated in ways to show how good they were, how worthy they were to be close to God. This is their cultures. They believed that by displaying themselves in righteousness, they could achieve righteousness. It was a covering of the dirt in people's lives. This is what Pastor Ken talked about last week. As Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and the people are waving palm branches and have their coats there, they cover up the dirt to keep him from being on it. And it's the same way we cover up the dirt in our lives as we feel Jesus is close and we don't want him to see that. If I can just keep this covered, if he just doesn't see this, I'll just hide this. That way he doesn't, he doesn't get bothered by it. You know, I'll just do some good things on top of this and that'll, that'll take care of it, right? Covers it up. We, from the very beginning, have believed that by covering, we can make ourselves right with God. I have a friend who says it this way. He says, it's like putting white frosting on a burnt cake. It doesn't change the fact that it's a burnt cake. It makes it look pretty. Unless I'm doing the frosting, it doesn't look that great. But still, we can make it look pretty, but it doesn't change it. And God knows what's underneath. 
We're working, striving, straying in an attempt to make ourselves clean, all the while finding more dirt on us with each passing day. It's like being buried alive face down and digging at the dirt, trying to escape, not realizing you're going deeper into it and covering yourself even more. That's exactly what it looks like to try to save yourself from the spiritual death you're in through your good deeds. See, our good deeds to God, according to the book of Isaiah, he says are like filthy rags. He says this because when I do good things in order to earn something from God, I have selfishness attached to each one of them. It's like I'm taking this good thing and I'm dipping it in a bucket of selfish sinfulness and then handing it to God and saying, I hope this gets me something. He says they're filthy rags to him. They're unclean. It doesn't do anything. It's not what he requires. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 shows us this great picture of Jesus as he steps into his earthly ministry. It says, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said this, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. You see, covering was never the answer. Covering was not what God was trying to do. God's plan was to cleanse, not to cover. This wasn't the solution. His desire is to be in a real relationship with you, with me, with us. Unhindered by anything, nothing between us. Fully uncovered and together in his perfect, fulfilling presence. For this to happen, though, we cannot be covering up our sin. We need to be cleansed from it. We can't just cover it. It's got to be taken away. In Hebrews 10, 10, Jesus continues. We see this beautiful picture here. It says, and by that will, this is the same will it's talking about when Jesus says, I have come to do your will, my God. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We are made holy, made righteous, made clean through him. We're purified, not just covered. We're cleansed and set free from this. He has done the work. He has paid the price. I don't know if you know this. As Jesus hung on the cross, he uttered these words as he breathed out his last breath. He said, it is finished. It was a banking term that he said. It meant paid in full. There was a debt that was owed and there were debtors that owed it. And he said, I'm making the payment and it is complete. The debt has been paid on behalf of those who owe it. That's what he's saying. It's done. And like a final drum roll, the earth shook, the stone rolled, and he declared the power of sin and death defeated as well as he rose from the grave. There's no more need for covering because he has overcome not because we deserved it, but because of his great love for us. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love how it says this. It doesn't just say, while we were at our best, while we showed the most potential, while we were working our hardest, while we had the right amount of tassels on, doesn't say those things. It says, while you're at your worst, while you're a sinner, the deepest, darkest, most broken part of you, he sees and says, I can redeem that and I want that. I long for that, I need that, I created that to be with me. And I will do whatever it takes. I will pay whatever price it costs. I want that. Give them to me. Because of his love for us. Ephesians 2, four through five says this, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sin and transgression. It is by grace you've been saved. You see, the uncovered, empty tomb brings full hope to those who put their faith in Jesus, that no matter where they've been, no matter what they've done, no matter how far gone they feel, there is love for them. There is love that drove our God to become man, live perfectly, die innocently with our guilt upon him and rise victoriously with our victory in his hands. I think about these last few weeks, we've been having a little bit of a, I don't know if you wanna call it science or magic going on up here. I don't think it's been much magic. Here's what we've done. We've got this tank here. 
And on, on uh, Palm Sunday, Pastor Ken uh, came and he, he talked about that this, this tank represents us, but we have a lot of sin in our lives. And, and he took it, we'll put it up here on the screen so you can see it. But he, he took dirt and poured it into this tank to show this is what our lives look like. This is the sin in our lives and it plagues us and it gets in every bit of it. And then Pastor uh, Luke on Friday talked about how into our sin, the, the blood of Jesus is applied. He died paying the price for those sins. See, blood sacrifice though was a covering throughout the whole story of scripture up to this point. And in the same way, we've got this covered here in this way. And I want to show you, it's nothing magical here, okay? You see, it's still just a covering at this point. Now, Jesus' sacrifice, that was not just a covering. There's something different about it. You see, Jesus, when he died and paid that price, he didn't just cover our sins. His righteousness was poured out for us and into us. And we have been declared righteous in him so that there is no longer any sin in us. We have been made clean and new and restored because it's his righteousness and not ours. What I love about this is that Jesus doesn't just cover our sins. He removes them. He gets rid of them. He has defeated the power that they have over us for anyone who puts their faith in him and trusts that by Jesus' death, paying the price for their sins, that their debt is paid and that by Jesus rising from the dead, there is new life that they can have through him and they can enter boldly and confidently into the presence of God who created them to be with him if you're here and you've known Jesus for a long time, I pray you don't forget this truth. Because this truth is everything. It's the central point of our entire faith. It's that Jesus has paid it all and given us new life, life that is full. If you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus and this is new to you and news to you, my prayer is that it's good news to you because guess what? It is. You are a sinner separated from God. Sin is not just bad things I do. It's an open rebellion against God and his character. It's me going in the opposite direction of what God has created and called me to do. And it plagues me. I'm born with it. I am born separated from God. But God who loves me so much sent his son Jesus who died, shed his blood and has made a way for me to be made clean and be brought back and reconciled to God. That means restored in relationship with the one who we were made to be with. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I wanna invite you to do that today. I'm gonna to be standing down here during the closing parts of our service and there's gonna be a whole team of people here. There's gonna be people in room 103 right at these doors if you don't wanna come up forward. We wanna to talk to you about this and pray with you to help you understand what it looks like to put your faith in Jesus. I'm gonna make it real simple. Here's what it is. It's taking all the weight of what it would take to save you, placing it in his hands, knowing that he's already done the work to do it. He's already accomplished it. And he offers you a free gift. It is by grace you've been saved. Grace is a gift that you do not deserve and cannot earn, but is offered to you anyways. This is what's beautiful about Easter. He rose from the dead, giving us hope that is eternal and a life that starts the moment we put our faith in him and lasts forever. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I invite you during these closing songs to come, to, to come and pray with us. Let us come alongside you and walk with you in this new faith. But I wanna pray as the worship team comes back up to close us and feel free to come forward as you're ready. God, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, and for sending your son, Jesus, to die in our place, to bring us into a place where we have what we've longed for, acceptance, approval, and love, God, that we have been brought into new life, where we can be fulfilled in you, by you, and through you alone. God, I just pray 
If there's anyone here who has not yet experienced stepping through that new curtain of Jesus into new life, God, would you draw them to your presence by your spirit? God, make today the day of salvation. God, we praise you for Jesus and his sacrifice, for his victorious resurrection, and for the life that we can have in him, the relationship that we can have with you through him and him alone. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's pause for a moment. If God is tugging on your heart, would you come forward? Make that step, take that step. God is calling. Don't ignore the pull. God died for you and he wants to have an intimate relationship. If you are not 100% certain about your salvation, come forward. Pray with someone. Get things right between you and God. standing shamefully in a courtroom surrounded by demons on my left and angels on my right with Satan as the prosecutor holding millions of records about my life and God sitting on a throne with a gavel in his mighty hand. I had no lawyer placed on trial for things such as lying, stealing, fornication. This was just the beginning of my tribulation. There was no reason to plead an innocent statement for all the evidence was already sitting right there with Satan. The demon smiled as tears flood flowed down the judge's eyes. They clearly knew it was now the hour of my demise. But wait, in came a light shining so bright that the demon smiling suddenly jumped with fright. And the man who stepped in through the doors that night was none other than Jesus Christ. Darkness departed to give way. And glory was all the angels could say as this man walked inside, pulled out a lighter, and immediately set Satan's records against me on fire. He then took the sentence file and erased my name and looked right at me and said, son, I'll take the blame. Immediately, handcuffs were placed on this man and he was thrown to the ground. The whole courtroom gasped at this horrendous sound and the sudden cease of beat to his heart. The same man who walked in glowing had now become dark. I did this to him. He took my blame for my lying, my stealing, my lusting, and my blaspheming and took all the pain spending three days in the grave when I was to go to hell for eternity. I left the courtroom that day and there was nothing I could say. I was found innocent for Christ handled the debt I was to pay. This type of love is more than you can ever give to a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife. This man died for me. I owe him my life. And even though my life is not wor at all worth it, because now how could anyone trade perfect for perfect? See, I gave my life to Christ and suddenly he pulled out a mop. The lying, cursing, cheating, all that had to stop because I realized now my life had been bought and it would be a shame to do nothing with it and let it rot. My battle with sin isn't something I fought. It's co-abiding with Christ that makes me live as I ought. Look, I'm not perfect and the will to sin isn't completely diminished, but I believe Jesus' words before he died for me on that cross, it, is finished.
working on your heart, please don't hesitate. Come on up. There's still time to pray with someone. Give your life to Christ. Give it to Christ. It's the thing that matters most in life. It's what make, makes life count. I believe. I believe in Jesus. salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Hey, I believe. I believe in the crucifixion, by His blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, his life is destined to Oh, praise to God the Father, oh, praise to Christ the Son, oh, praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore. Mighty name, I believe. I believe, I believe. Yeah. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me. Far beyond what hearts imagine. Yes, you've heard. I believe that a day is coming He's returning to claim His bride Light the altar, keep it burning See the Lamb who rolls the world in light All praise to God the Father All praise to Christ the Son All praise to the Holy Spirit
It's by believing in the finished work of Jesus that we are saved, not by works that we've done. And we get to grow in him. After we've placed our faith, we're not left alone. We get the Holy Spirit inside of us. And we get the community of God's people to grow alongside with. And that's exciting to grow with God's people. Men, there's a great opportunity this coming week to, to step into every man a warrior. We had about 15 or so guys go through that before. This time around, starting up next week, and, and there's actually two groups. We've had to split it up because there's so many men that want to step into their walk with Jesus and become better husbands and fathers and walk out the, the walk that God has for them. That's coming up next week or the 21st. Those are two different start dates for two separate groups. We encourage you to jump into church center and get on the app there or talk to somebody in the lobby or in one of these people and we'll get you plugged into that. Ladies, there's a group starting up on the 14th, going through Romans 12, learning about your identity in Christ and what it means to worship and, and how to respond in relationship to any situation. That's exciting. So jump into that, gals. And you've got a brunch coming up too on May 11th um, and a lot of things there. Uh, next weekend, we've got Sanctus Real, Unspoken, and JJ Weeks performing here. That's gonna be awesome. Uh, sold out show last time. And we've added another artist to that. Matt Baird is going to be joining us on Saturday night as well. And he'll also be leading worship on Sunday morning. So join us at 8 o'clock or 11 o'clock next week. Hey, lots of opportunities to get involved. But if you're new to Mitchell Berean, join us for lunch after the 11 o'clock service next week. And we'd love to get to know you and let you know about some of these opportunities. Blessings. Have a wonderful Resurrection Sunday living in the power that God gives us as we place our faith and trust in him. Amen. Have a wonderful day.